Good morning, Northside Community Church. And here we are. We are getting ready uh, this morning to read from the book of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 17. And there are several disciples in John, chapter 21, that had just witnessed another fish miracle on the shore of Galilee. Uh, Think about this. The catch of 153 fish at Jesus' command pointed to a larger Holy Spirit Pentecostal catch. When one day over 3,000 human fish were caught, or I should say were saved, through the empowering gospel sermon of Peter. So the miracle was a reminder for us to follow Jesus And when we follow Jesus, we are to share the gospel as fishers of men to those who are lost in a sea of sin. See, the difference between a fisherman and a fish catcher is a big deal. Now, most of you, you know that I really love fishing, so much so that it started to concern me. I was like, why why do I love fishing so much? I mean, it was something that my father and I did together, and and I just love that. But it goes way beyond that. So I started to study, and I came to this conclusion that there are two kinds of fishermen. There is a fisherman or woman or child, but then there are fish catchers. And a fisherman is someone who gets all their gear together, make sure they have bait in their chair and their table, and they might bring some board games that they could play, a lantern, uh, and, and they bring an ice chest full of food and drink, and they head out to the lake or to the river, and then they get their pole and they heave it out there into the river or into the lake, and they put it in a pole holder and they wait. And while they're waiting, they go play games, and they might even invite some friends to come with them. And, and they just have a good old time. And if the fish bother them, they don't care, you know. But a fish catcher is somebody who has really studied fish. I'd be a fish catcher. So here's what I'm saying. A fish catcher is someone who starts to study fish so much that they know the different species. They know the different varieties of trout. And for myself, trout is my main fish I love to catch. So I've studied the fact of what temperature the water has to be for them to really be feeding. Uh, What is the pH factor that has to be in the water? Uh, You know, uh, are they, what kind of food are they eating? Is it aquatic insects or is it terrestrial insects that have been blown into the water? A fish catcher studies that so much so that I even, as I was researching this, found out that fish, as they look at the food that they're about to eat, they predetermine how much energy it's going to take for them to go retrieve that food and bring it back. And if it was beneficial, if they gained protein and energy from that, then the fish would go feed on it. So these are all the factors that a fish catcher puts into this consideration. Now, I tell you this because in our sermon this morning, we're going to be talking about Love. So what does love have to do with fishing? Everything. I love fishing. But in the Greek, there are three words that we use for love. I'm going to be talking about two of them this morning. And the first word is phileo. Now, a fisherman is somebody who really phileos fishing. I know I'm kind of stretching it, but stay with me. I, I, I think this is the best way for me to illustrate it to you. And a fish catcher is somebody who agape loves fishing. So phileo is more of a brotherly love, that of emotions and feelings and friendships and all that. Agape love is a love in the Greek word that is about a love that is sacrificial, a love that is a commitment. See, that is agape love. Now, Today's scripture, it continues uh, after the disciples had seen that it was Jesus on the shore and they have breakfast with the risen Savior on the beach. 
And in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, it reads, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Agape. Jesus is speaking in the form of agape love here. And he says to him, yes, Lord, this is Peter, you know that I love you, phileo, remember, brotherly love. And he says to him, feed my lambs. And then in verse 16, we read, he says to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Again, Jesus is speaking in agape, sacrificial love. And he says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, phileo, brotherly. And Jesus said, tend or take care of my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? But here's the thing. Now Jesus says, phileo. This is the term as we translate the love in this text of what he was saying, then the word phileo is the word that we see. And Peter was grieved. He hurt. And he was actually sorrowful because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? Do you phileo me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you, phileo. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. So this brings us to our first point for the morning, a call to the highest love. See, this is the third appearance by Jesus to the disciples since the resurrection and Peter being present at all three events. Now, Peter had denied Jesus, and this is interesting. Peter had denied Jesus three times. And now Jesus asks him, and this is after his resurrection, do you love me? Three times. Interesting. Now, Peter has denied Jesus three times while Jesus was being interrogated, uh, leading to his crucifixion. And now Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? The first time saying, do you love me more than these Remember that? We read that in verse 15. Do you love me more than these? See, it would have been one thing to have a friend or a spouse uh, to question you three times. And some of you may have had that. But to have them question you three times. But what if the resurrected Christ, Jesus himself, questioned you with these words? Do you love me more than these? First of all, we have two different Greek words that I was talking about in our passage that translates love. First, we have phileo, love. Phileia refers to the brotherly love. See, there is a town of brotherly love called Philadelphia, Phileia. Today, we probably would call that kind of love BFF, because in our English vernacular, we don't really have the specific words that you see in the Greek for love. But I think as a society, we have now determined that BFF, best friends forever, uh, let me do this. That's where this came from, I think. Does that look like a heart? Best friends forever. Uh, You see, our society today, this is considered the closest friendship. BFF, and we display an affectionate love for each other, and as each seek to make the other one happy in this relationship. You see, we don't want to ever let our friends down because we phileo them. See, this kind of love involves feelings of warmth and affection towards another person. See, we don't have phileo love towards our enemy. We have phileo love towards brothers and sisters. Secondly, we have an agape love. Love, uh, agape speaks of is the noblest type of love. Specifically, a love that 
is more than a feeling. And it's not a quote from the song of Boston in 1976, for those of you who were around then. See, it is actually an act of will. More than a feeling. See, agape is an act of will. Jesus himself is personified as agape love in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, when I first read 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm being really honest with you, it overwhelmed me. As I read it, love, love is all these things. No one ever told me that. And I realized in that moment, as I was reading 1 Corinthians 13, that God the Father had written a letter to his child, Ed Rain. And he was telling me how to love as a Christian man. That was a real overwhelming moment the first time I read that. You see, people in Jesus' time often did not make a distinction between the word agape and philea, or phileo. But the Bible does. Many times, the two, they were interchangeable as we read Scripture. However, God commands us to have agape love towards everyone, everyone, to even agape love our enemies. I know, that's almost like a hard pill to swallow, but it's truth. The first time Jesus asked the question to Peter, he asked if Peter loved Jesus more than these. You remember that? We just read it. Was Jesus pointing to the boatload of fish still sitting there as he asked the question? That meant a lot of dollars for just a few of those fishermen that were there. In other words, as they looked at that net of fish, they were going to be cashed up. There was a hunk of money there. Do you love me more than your personal profit? Do you love me more than your profession, than your career, or even your livelihood? Do you love me more than your calling? Are you willing to sacrifice what you may love most in life in order to follow me? This is what Jesus is saying. Agape love is a love that God has for his people, which prompted the sacrifice. Now hear me on this. It prompted the sacrifice of his only son, Jesus, for our sins. Do you love me more than your interests? Or maybe Jesus was asking if Peter loved him more than the other disciples that were there. After all, Peter had denied Jesus. Remember that. And his denial, unknown to Peter at the moment, was being recorded in the Bible for all the people in the world to hear. Maybe he was asking Peter if he loved Jesus more than he loved his friends. See, they went back to fishing when they thought Jesus was dead. Now think about this. Jesus was crucified on the cross. And in that moment, Peter was denying him. When they were crucifying Jesus, Peter had just denied him three times. I think about that, and I think about how is Peter feeling right now, standing in front of Jesus? Because he didn't have that opportunity to say, forgive me for denying you when Jesus had died. He didn't have that opportunity. But now he's standing face to face with Jesus again. And it brings an incredible hurt or sorrow, sorrow to him. So the fishermen, they went back to fishing after they found out that Jesus was dead. Peter assembled the apostles because when Jesus was crucified, they hid. Oh no, we're going to be next. Let's hide. And they were in the room and, and, and Peter and the other disciples that were fishermen, they said, hey, our leader, he's just died. I guess it's over. I guess the way 
of Jesus is done, this movement. And so we should go back to what we do. And so let's start a new company. Let's start a new fishing company, and we'll go back to work. So this is when Jesus sees them. And he says, throw the net on the other side. And they do. And there's a, an abundant of, amount of fish. They had been fishing all night. Hadn't caught a thing. Jesus says, this man on the shore, because they didn't identify that it was Jesus at the time, says, throw it on the other side. So they do. Now, here's the thing. The people that God calls to represent him are called to a higher degree of the highest love. And this is what Peter is finding out. After all, we are all called to deny ourselves. There's no doubt in that. As followers of Christ, we are called to deny ourselves, not to deny our Savior. We are called to declare and not deny Jesus. See, the reason that we were created is to bring all glory to God and to love him with an everlasting love that is within us now when we receive Christ. See, the reason that we are saved is to follow and to declare our Savior. And so the risen Jesus said to Peter and to us, I believe in this moment that he's saying it to us, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Our second point for the morning, the cure for denial is a sorrowful heart. See, if you do feed my lambs, and so this is what Jesus is saying. And so a second time, Jesus says, do you truly love agape me? And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Phileo, brotherly love. And Jesus says, take care of my sheep. Then, Quickly, a third time, he says to him, do you love me? Phileo. Now, Jesus has turned the coin on, it, on, on Peter here. He's saying, okay, do you brotherly love me? Uh, Peter was hurt. When Jesus called him out the third time, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? Phileo. Jesus asked Peter two times before, do you agape me? Do you love me with an unfailing commitment and sacrificial love, Peter? Then Jesus asked him the third time. Jesus, he reverted to the lesser degree of love now. The degree to which Peter had replied. See, this is why Peter was hurt. Peter got it. He understood that he was talking about brotherly love when Jesus was saying, no, it's all about sacrificial love. Do you love me, Peter, sacrificially? And Peter's like, yeah, you're a bro. I love you like a bro. We could be fishermen together. We can play cards and we do all kinds of stuff. But that's not what Jesus was calling him to. He was actually, Peter was actually grieved now because he came to the understanding of his heir. And he was thrown into sorrow. See, what we usually mean by being hurt is that we are unwilling to forgive someone else for a wrong that they have done against us. We say that we are hurt, but that is actually happening. What is actually happening here is that we are exalting ourselves over the aggressor or the perpetrator and saying to ourselves, I am worth better treatment than this. See, I'm going to continue to hold on to my anger against you until you somehow make it right. And oftentimes that's how it plays out. But Peter's hurt was different. He was hurt because he was convicted. It wasn't because he was victimized in that sense. Peter was hurt and he was convicted because he understood his part in this relationship with Jesus. At that point, Peter could have attempted uh, and, and, and accepted the truth. Or he could have moved into denial. 
See, he was kind of like in a fork in the road. Now, he either accepted the truth or he decided to go into denial. Peter understood the reality of what he had done. So his choice was that of truth. The cure for denial is a repentant heart. Think about that. When we live in denial, the cure for that is a repentant heart. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. Listen to how this reads. For though I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did not regret it, for I see that the letter caused you sorrow. Though only for a while, I now rejoice not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is in accordance to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world, it produces death. See, Paul uses the word hurt and sorrow seven times in the three verses that we just read. Restoration and reconciliation, they follow repentance. Repentance happens first. The bottom line is that godly sorrow, it produces repentance without regret. The pain and the sorrow of repentance are not penalties in the lives of the believers. Listen to what it reads in Psalm chapter 126, verse 5. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. I'm going to read that again. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. We know that Peter's heart was hurt. We understand that. But yet, he professes the authority of the Savior. Peter responds to Jesus. Here's what he says. You know all things, and you knew before I denied you three times that I would do so. You knew my heart then, and you know my heart now, that I phileo love you as the closest friend. Peter knows that the love of God in Christ is far greater than his sin or his denial. Godly sorrow, repentance brings renewal and, and it brings intimacy with the Savior because godly repentance brings us face to face with Jesus and his in, infinite love. Godly sorrow and repentance among followers of Jesus, it will do the same. People, in Jesus Christ, we, can, we can't possibly play the victim from each other if we have forgiven each other. Do you hear me on that? Because God's love for each and every one of us does not allow us to have that kind of behavior, the victim mentality. In Peter's repentance, Jesus calls Peter into a specific ministry now. This is really interesting. See, a sorrowful and repentant heart towards one's own sin and a profession of truth in the Almighty God and Savior to forgive, to save, and to reconcile. See, this will produce a heart that will trust and obey God. Peter was called and appointed by Jesus to become a pastor, a preacher, who would train and feed and care and equip his people those of the first century church whom God had called into fellowship through the gospel to serve him. And so they would be fish catchers of men as well as Peter. See, this appearance of Jesus on the beach, it shows that the mission assigned to the disciples did not end with Jesus' death and the resurrection but it was only the beginning of their ministry. It was only the beginning and the mission of the gospel. Now, the mission of the church 
It continues as God calls fishers of men into ministry and into service. For Peter, this would be a calling of a pastor to formally teach God's people the word and to bring it to those who were lost. See, that's not everyone's calling. I get that. I understand that. But it is everyone's calling to relationally teach the gospel to everyone that we meet. Did you hear me on that? To relationally teach. You see, when, when my wife, Cindy, and I, when we were young and we had just, our girls were little bitty girls, we were new in Christ. And we joined a church that had a young Mary's group. And we would do our small group with them. And we would do Bible studies. But there was times that we didn't do Bible studies. And here's the thing. We would be doing a birthday party or something like that. And we'd all be getting together. No Bible study there, but somewhere in that gathering, people start talking about God in the Bible. And before you knew it, we're pretty much having a Bible study. I think back on that time, and I believe that the people in my group that Cindy and I were being mentored by, they had an agape love with God. Because once you have the agape love, then all the other love comes. And so that's what we have seen. That in our lives, Cindy and I, that we really learned a lot about God through watching other people love him. See, there is, so, there's not, there is no such thing as a spectator who follows Christ. Think about that. There are no spectators that are followers of Christ. Think about this. Salvation is God's idea, not man's. Making fishers of men and disciples. This is God's idea too. Ministry and serving is God's idea also. Providing for ministry and service that comes from God also. Now, he accomplishes it through those that have been caught in the net of the gospel of love. Those who believe. Someone had to share the gospel with you. Think about that. Someone had to share the gospel with you. So now we share it with someone else. And that's how it works. We share the gospel with someone else. And Sunday mornings is not necessarily where you first hear the gospel. Some of you, it may have been. For me, it happened on a Sunday morning. But I've known many other people who came to know the Lord because somebody else was sharing the gospel relationally with them. Whenever we gather, it is to praise and to worship our Lord and our Savior, to adore Him and to glorify His Word and His Spirit together so that we are equipped to go out from the church and to go fishing. Exercising the gospel everywhere we go. If we are going to glorify anything, we are going to glorify in the gospel and worship our Savior, God, the Lord Jesus Christ. We glory in the gospel as we talk about God's love and His great greatness to those people that are around us, our friends, our neighbors, our family. We learn how to weave the gospel into our everyday life and into our conversations. We love him because we have been loved by him. We serve him as fishermen of men and women and children because he first caught us in his love. And we serve out of gratitude, and from a willing heart, not from a spirit of obsession or of compulsion, that kind of behavior. Peter became known as the apostle of hope. Now, as Jesus reinstates Peter as a disciple and as one who would care for the believers, Peter, he begins to realize this great depth of Christ's love and forgiveness for him. Uh, think about this. Peter, as a disciple and as one who would care for other believers, Peter 
begins to realize the great depth of God's love and forgiveness. Remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. And in this conversation with Jesus, Peter is now being brought back into the circle of the apostles. Imagine what the other apostles are thinking now. Hey, there's that guy that denied Jesus. But Jesus himself is now commissioning him right in front of the others. He's saying, take care of my sheep. Be their pastor. Jesus is bringing Peter back into the fold. Even though he denied him and even refused to identify himself with the other disciples and that he refused to even admit that he knew the very Jesus who died for him. See, in Luke chapter 7, verse 47, we understand that Jesus had taught that, that to the one who was forgiven little, he or she would love little. And to the one who is forgiven much, then he or she will forgive much and love much. This brings us to our third point for the morning. A repentant heart will trust and obey. A repentant heart will trust and obey. Now, Peter, he accepts Jesus, his appointment for him. Remember, Jesus was appointing him to be a shepherd. If Jesus had said it, I have to trust it. That's what Peter's thinking. If, if Jesus has said it, I have to trust him and I have to obey him. So Peter's back. See, this is not the end of Peter's story, but the beginning. This is actually the beginning of the story. Jesus called Peter not to be with him, uh, to follow Jesus only for three hours or three days or three weeks, but for the rest of his, his earthly life. He was given the responsibility to shepherd others for the next three decades. It was not until the Holy Spirit had filled him in Pentecost that he was able to witness. And there was no denying now. There was no denying who Jesus was. Now, the same Peter who clearly had denied Jesus now affirms his love for Christ on the shore of Galilee. And he stood up in the crowd a few weeks later after this conversation, and he declared it. And listen to the words in Acts chapter 2, verses 32 through 38. Listen, listen to what he said. This is what Peter said. God has risen this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promise, Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, and yet he said, the Lord has said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Verse 36, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Following means fishing. People, if we're going to be followers of Christ, it's time to go fishing. See, fellowshipping with Jesus Christ and being faithful to the greatest shepherd, are, I guess the question would be, are you faithful to him by serving him? Are you faithful to him by serving him? Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 through 21. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with ever, everything good for doing his will, and may he work in, his, in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom God, 
be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Let me just do a quick review. Our first point, fishers of men are called to a higher degree of the highest love. Do you love me more than this? Jesus is asking, what is your this? Do you love me more than this? See, we are called to deny ourselves, not to deny our Savior. We are called to deny ourselves. Our second point, the cure for denial is a sorrowful heart. Restoration and reconciliation, they follow repentance. Are you repentant? Are there things that you need to repent from? Peter's heart was hurt, but he professed that Jesus is all-powerful. He is a Savior. And he said, you know all things. Our third point for the morning a repentant heart will trust and obey. Believers are called into relationship and into ministry. People, we are called into relationship with each other, with the Lord, and we are called into servanthood. So following means fishing. Are you fishermen or a fish catcher? Are you fellowshipping with Christ and his body? the church? Are you committed being faithful to the great shepherd? I guess the question would be, have you really asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Where do you find yourself this morning spiritually? I'm going to pray for you right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this word this morning. And Lord, this morning, if there is someone who is really feeling that they have denied you, that they've loved other things more than you, that they have not agape you, then Lord, I pray that today would be the day that forgiveness could come to their home. So I pray for them, Lord, that through your grace and your mercy, so Lord, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, you'll speak to us. We thank you, Lord, for all that we receive. We thank you, for dying on the cross for our sins. Be with us now, Lord, as we want to receive you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God be with you and God bless you.